today I'll be talking about um, our Keystone pipeline that we built at Netflix and the stream processing as a service platform. Uh, as you all may know, Netflix is uh, a data-driven company and we generate over three petabytes worth of events every single day so that we can derive business insights and give our members a really good experience uh, when it comes to watching our content and what kind of content uh, we can offer our customers. So to typically, um, to process these real-time events has meant that majority of the time is spent in building out the infrastructure and handling the data and prepping the data. And very small time uh, gets left to actually do the data analysis. So we are trying to um, reverse that equation so that our engineers and data engineers can spend more time doing the data analysis and less time having to worry about the infrastructure they build. Uh, so to that effort, we are building a self-serve, uh, multi-tenant, and fault-tolerant stream processing as a service platform uh, so that all the engineers at Netflix can leverage it. Uh, so I'm, I'm Manal Dakshini, and I lead the stream processing infrastructure team at Netflix. And I'll share our experience today about building such a platform and the lessons we've learned along the way. So we'll look at the Ingest pipeline, we'll look at what our stream processing service as a service looks like, uh, how we evolve it in runtime while keeping it up 24 seven, and uh, we'll pepper it with the lessons learned along the way. So we have over 93 million members uh, in over 190 countries, and our service gets access from over 1,000 different kinds of devices, and each member not member, but overall we have about 125 million hours of video is watched every single day. And this leads to us generating over a trillion events a day uh, to learn more about what's happening with their service, how our users are interacting with their service, and we can learn more about uh, how our service is doing. So how many Netflix members in this room? Oh, that's great. You were, you were one of those 93 million. So uh, ingest pipelines, when you have a lot of these events flowing through our system, having robust ingest pipelines is very critical because that enables you to do additional functionality on top. If you're not able to successfully and reliably ingest these events, then all bets are off because you don't have enough data to uh, gain insights into it. So at a very high level, uh, we have all the events that are being produced at the devices. They end up in our edge services. And from there, they make it their way into our Keystone pipeline. That's our ingest pipeline. And that's built on our stream processing as a service platform. So it's a product that we built internally that we offer to our internal data engineers who are our customers and other engineers. And uh, we do a bunch of processing, whether it's user specified in terms of a DSL or a point and click mechanism, or they write custom code. And the data ends up uh, as results in some kind of a sync. It's a pretty high level view of how the data flows. So our stream processing service has uh, three ways we offer people to write jobs uh, to solve progressively difficult problems. So one is point and click pipelines. Uh, this is the core infrastructure where you uh, realize, an engineer realizes that they want to create a new event stream. And there are some interesting events to be captured. Uh, so traditionally, You'd have to uh, you know, set up some kind of a buffer in the front so you can hold your events. You'll have to worry about the infrastructure. You'll have to worry about where you send the data. So to simplify that, what we've done is we've created point and click pipelines. So user comes in, they provision a stream, and then we provision for it. And the second way a user can um, add functionality so that they can derive insights is by specifying uh, filtering and projection through a DSL that we provide. This is an active area of uh, development. We, have, uh, uh, we are looking into enhancing this quite a bit, but today it just supports basic filtering and projection. And then the third way is a uh, user can specify and write custom code. Uh, this is built on the infrastructure we have where it makes it very easy for them to uh, get the base code starter. They have reusable components they can use uh, to build their services. And uh, the uh, CI pipelines for them is already set up so they can do continuous deployments. 
Um, and we have integrations with Docker, so they can easily run what they build even locally on their machine. So in the first section, we'll look at uh, the point-and-click pipelines and the DSLs. So a user usually uh, sees this when they land on our page to create a new stream. So they provision a brand new stream. Uh, here we see that the stream's already provisioned. Uh, it's an example of a stream here. What this ends up doing is, at this layer where we see, where we see it says Keystone, we create a brand new Kafka topic called CL event. Once the user clicks on a create stream event, we ask them to enter a bunch of config information. One of them is what's the name, what's the approximate rate that you expect to send events into, what's the byte rate basically. Now it does not have to be exact, it's an initial number. We automatically adjust to it as the traffic changes at a later point in time, but we want an approximate guess so that we can provision the right kind of resources for it. And then the user configures where they want their events to be routed to. Do they want it to go to Hive? Do they want it to go to Elasticsearch? And uh, what you see here called Kato is just another Kafka cluster so that we can route it for further processing and analysis. Every path that you see here from the producer to Hive or producer to Elasticsearch and producer to K2 is isolated at this processing layer. So that if you have slowdowns in any one of your syncs, it does not impact the processing of events that are flowing to the other system. The first point of entry into the system is Kafka. So we have ways to buffer your data so that even if your producer goes down, we don't lose data. And the next thing in the configuration UI that they can do is specify filters. Now, this is basic filtering that they may want to do based on the data that's flowing in. And here's, a, here's an example. So we support an expat style. It's our own internal parser that we built. Um, and this is an area that we want to make more enhancements of. So here it's a very simple example where based on a certain field, the event type, uh, it gets routed to a certain cluster or it doesn't get routed. So the stream that we looked at here uh, going to Hive is a subset of what ends up in Elasticsearch and Kafka. And we can, multi we can have multiple routings to the same sync and each one can have slightly different parameters or slightly different filters and, and projections as well. And what we call syncs is also called outputs here where your results end up at. So in addition to provisioning a Kafka topic, la launching a bunch of stream processing jobs with the filters you've specified and uh, scale that appropriately, uh, make it run 24 seven, we also generate a bunch of dashboards and uh, alert configurations. So we generate dashboards for tracking how fast the stream's doing, are there any errors in the stream, uh, were the filters set up correctly, uh, is the difference between what's filtered and what's coming in the right so we know there's no data loss there? Uh, is, it, is the stream lagging behind? So when you're processing uh, a stream of events, you want to make sure you're able to keep up with it because your buffer is only so large in the front. If you're not able to keep up and uh, you're not able to process as fast, you may actually lose those events. So we keep track of how slow or fast our processing is of these events so the lags don't build up in the system. And it also impacts the latencies downstream if uh, further stream processing needs to happen. And uh, for alerts, we do set up alert configurations for each of these mini pipelines, or we like to call them data streams. And uh, if they're having errors, if they're lagging behind, uh, we do get alerted, and then we take appropriate actions. Uh, we have automations to deal with it. So for example, if we have uh, a certain spike in input requests, and if it lasts for a certain period of time, then we scale up our uh, infrastructure so that the number of jobs, the number of instances for jobs that are running will increase so we can keep up with the traffic. And after a certain period of time, if the traffic dies down, we can scale down. 
And uh, we can also handle failures across region, right? What happens if, if we run an AWS, so what happens if one region has issues and our traffic gets evacuated to a different region? Now the other region, because all the users are being routed to a different region, we do get a lot more events that we were getting before. So we scale that region up to deal with that additional traffic or events that are flowing into the system. So let's dig a little bit deeper and see what's happening inside uh, the infrastructure that we call the Keystone pipeline. So the red line boundaries here, everything in between is an infrastructure. We do have a couple of components for making it easier for our producers to produce events. So we have a library that's a wrapper on top of Kafka. And the reason we do that is we want it to be better integrated into our metric system, into our ecosystem, uh, into our platform that makes it easier to write applications. And it also lets us do um, something called routing. So we can change a map here which tells us which Kafka topic to go to or which Kafka cluster to go to. So what that means is uh, we can dynamically change that in, in case of a failure. And I'll go over it in a bit uh, later on in this presentation. The other option we have is for non-Java based uh, or third party apps that can only uh, talk to like an HTTP proxy. So we have a way for them to set events through our proxy. All those events land up on uh, a whole bunch of fronting Kafka clusters. We run over 50, 52 Kafka clusters and around close to 4,500 brokers in three regions. So it's a pretty large fleet that uh, is dealing with you know, trillions of events a day. And uh, if you notice here, there's a Kafka here and then you'll see a bunch of Kafka clusters down here. The reason for this isolation is we want really high availability of these Kafka clusters so that we can provide at least once guarantee to our customers. And we don't want anybody other than our infrastructure consuming from this because we don't know what their access patterns are. We cannot control the fan out and we cannot control how and what kind of load they're um, applying on this cluster. So because this is the first line um, of defense where we're getting all our events and buffering it, uh, we want really, really high availability for it. So anybody who wants to do a processing where they don't know their predictable load or what kind of load they're going to put on the Kafka cluster or the fan out, then we just route those events to this cluster and other stream consumers. It could be Spark Streaming, it could be Flink, it could be our in-house Mantis uh, engine that could take those events and process it. So the event producers produces the event, they land up in the fronting Kafka clusters, um, and the router is the piece that builds the ingest pipeline. And it's a bunch of jobs that are built on a stream processing platform framework, which is running on Docker containers. It's currently doing uh, Flink. We use Flink as a stream processing engine. And all this gets set up declaratively automatically. Once a user clicks on provision in the UI, we would end up creating a new topic here and provision it correctly and, and on the right target cluster for the, for the kind of byte rates that they've asked us to provision it for. Uh, we launch a whole bunch of uh, jobs here. And then uh, the data lands up in uh, any of these things. So we have to offer at least once processing semantics because we have a lot of interesting data flowing through it and we want uh, good business insights. Uh, we have strict SLAs of uh, in around 1%. We cannot lose more than 1% of data for any given stream for a day because if it's more than that, then uh, we have violated our SLAs. When an event enters our system, we automatically inject a few metadata fields. Uh, we inject a GUID so that it's very easy for us to differentiate between retries of an event versus a brand new event being generated. Uh, so we've seen cases where the event producers themselves are creating the same event over and over again, maybe because of a bug or the way they've written it. Uh, and uh, we want to differentiate that versus our infrastructure library retrying the same event multiple times. 
So in the first scenario, it would generate multiple events with different GUIDs, but the same payload. In the second scenario, you would have the same, payload, same event being sent downstream, but with the same GUID. So it helps us deduplicate and understand the duplicate rates. Uh, we insert the timestamp. Uh, this could be used for event time-based processing downstream. Uh, host an app for traceability. And we also implemented a custom wire protocol which wraps the whole payload. So we have the Kafka protocol as the data flows into Kafka and then we wrap that with our custom wire protocol. Uh, the reason we added the custom wire protocol, there are several. We wanted to be able to control the forward and backwards compatibility. So for example, if you move different, between different versions of Kafka as we evolved it from version you know, A to version B, as new versions are available, the changes in the underlying protocol should not impact our system that we have to upgrade everything at the same time or not upgrade at all. So having our own custom wire protocol helps us offer that backwards compatibility so that we can seamlessly upgrade our infrastructure and keep it running 24 seven. The other reason is we can support different kind of serialization formats and offer reusable components to automatically serialize and deserialize them without the users having to worry about it. We can also use it to inject additional metadata so that we can add traceability from end to end and know what's happening to the event as it flows through the different paths of the system. Uh, we have uh, also invested in creating smart deployments. So some services or downstream customers are latency sensitive and some are duplicate sensitive. So based on that, we leverage how we do redeployments of our infrastructure and redeployments with, of their changes in the filters or projection. If there is a failure in one region and all the users are being evacuated to the other region, we automatically respond to those events from our internal automation and we'll scale up our fleet in one region to handle the events. And we scale based on um, current and historical traffic and we automatically pre-scale to a certain level so that we can handle that load. And there's an external process that's monitoring uh, these metrics about how much we are processing, what we are lagging, and what we need to scale up to. And we look at the incoming traffic, we look at the historical patterns of how fast we have been able to process, what our current provisioning is, and then we use that to kind of project what we need to be at, and then we do a redeployment at that point in time and expand the cluster. The other one is what happens if a fronting Kafka cluster goes down, right? What if there's an issue with it? So to deal with it, uh, we've built tooling to manage the failover. And uh, we also do something called Kafka Kong. So every week we intentionally turn kind of one cluster off to simulate a failure and then route it to a different cluster and then we try and recover it. And I'll go a little more detail into it as to how we exactly do that. So this whole pipeline actually processes over 1.3 trillion events every single day. We have about three petabytes going in, and as you saw, an example where you can have multiple fan outs out of the system, and different filters apply through different paths. So we have about nine petabytes out of worth of fan out. Uh, so it's a 3x fan out of the data we get in. And uh, we keep the system up and running. We have about four nines of availability. Now this does mean that sometimes we may have added latencies when we have downtime, but we don't lose data and the system still stays available. So resiliency is really key in achieving those four nines of availability and we go to great lengths to make sure that our systems are resilient. And so we take this whole thought into to heart and we've actually built something called Kafka Kong so a person who's on call every week uh, hits a button and uh, we go through this exercise. So what exactly happens? We have event producers producing events into this fronting Kafka cluster. Let's say this cluster goes down, our system detects that it's down, and then we have automation where we launch a brand new cluster, we recreate all the topics that were here onto this cluster, and then we change the map here on the producer saying, you're no longer gonna produce it to this cluster, the topic's created here, so you need to send all the events here. 
At the same time, we launch our routers, which are based on off-link infrastructure, to start processing the new data. We also leave the old routers running so that we can drain, if possible, anything we can drain out of this cluster. So we try, and try our best to get whatever we can and salvage out of this cluster. Sorry. And um, we have a mechanism to even switch back. So let's say we are able to recover this cluster again. Then we have automation which says, roll back, get rid of this cluster, go back to using the original cluster. The benefit of doing that is this cluster, we launch it at a much smaller capacity, smaller kind of instances than this one, so we can control costs, and it's, we know it's temporary. However, if you do find that this is absolutely unrecoverable, then we just throw it away and launch a new one, because uh, sometimes the environment in the cloud is such that, that it's not worth our time to spend a lot of time debugging exactly what happened, uh, and we may not have all the data, so we just launch a new cluster and we leave this aside, we quarantine it, and then we come back to it later on to debug as to what happened. So this is our automation. You can see some of our Kafka clusters in each of the region. Um, our engineers can pick any one of those clusters and then just hit a button uh, saying failover now, and then we have automation that does everything that I just talked about. And once the failover is complete, you can even say revert the cluster, so it'll tear down the temporary cluster, bring the traffic back, and it does everything. So it's a couple buttons worth of work, but there's a lot of automation that went behind it to make this happen. We didn't have this initially to start off with, um, and due to a bug and a zookeeper outage, our Kafka clusters went down and there was no way for us to recover it. So we learned the lessons like a year and a half ago and then we built this automation. And since then we are able to keep really high availability of our service. So let's get to the next stage of um, how engineers can write code, uh, sorry, stream processing jobs by specifying custom code. We'll look at that in context of two use cases. Uh, the first one is when user starts clicking on the website, on the UI, and start to play movies, uh, they want to enhance those events with additional data from other microservices. And this is one uh, such stream processing use case where they want to attach additional discovery attributes about what the user is doing on the site. Um, and the additional services in our backend system have the data about other events that are generated. So we want to enrich these events flowing through uh, the clicks that our users are generating on the different devices. And these are in the order of about 100 million events per day. And the challenge here is in a stream processing job, we have to connect to live services and uh, deal with the failures with those live services. How do we get the failbacks? How do we join that information into the stream that's flowing in and uh, make it work really well within our ecosystem and metrics? The second use case is uh, complex sessionization of user events. So as a user looks at a, a Netflix landing page, if you're familiar with the Netflix landing page, there are rows and rows of videos, right? Each row has a bunch of movies that's customized based on your personalization. And uh, how you interact with that rows, which Videos do you look at? So those are the impressions. You may just scroll through the video and look at which videos are available to play. You may click on certain videos, which would be the click impressions. And uh, we want to analyze these for your sessions. And these sessions can last between 8 to 24 hours, depending on the personalization and customization. And each session that we look at, I mean, normally when you look at web sessions, it's pretty clear there's a certain timeout. So you have a bunch of activity that a user does, and there is a gap. And when you hit that gap, you mark that the session's ended. Here, the neat requirement's very different. The beginning of a session and the end of a session is marked by what's in the data, what's in the payload. So the payload drives the start and the end of a session. And that's what we call this uh, you know, punctuated sessions, sessionization. And the events that we receive could be out of order. So for example, you could click on, you could scroll and view the movie, 
And when you know the right move you want to play, you'd play click on it. Now those two events could arrive out of order. And uh, you could view multiple videos before you actually click on one to play, or scroll through multiple videos before you click on one. So when you scroll through multiple ones, all those are part of a session, and then you end up clicking one and doing something with it, that would be kind of like the end of the session for that particular uh, duration. So we have a larger web session, if you will, where you don't get logged out for a certain number of time, and uh, that would be you know, 8 to 24 hours. And then within that bigger session window, we also have smaller activity sessions. And those could last from 2 to 24 hours. And uh, we want to make sure that the events that we get, even if they're out of order, right, we're able to start and end correctly. So let's take an example. You may scroll 10 movies, you click on the 11th one, and then you start playing it. Now, the movies that you've actually scrolled through, we want to know which movies you scrolled through uh, that caught your interest and the one that you clicked on. Those 10 events could come out of order. So let's say we get event 10 first, then we'd start the session at 10. Now, when we get the event first, we have to expand our session to include all those events that happen. Uh, so that's the challenge here. I mean, how do we create these sessions automatically and expand and contract them based on the data that's flowing through? And these are about, uh, for this specific use case, is about 10 billion events per day. Added to this, there are challenges uh, for how do we you know, make this more uh, scalable? Because we don't want our data engineers to worry about the infrastructure of building these. So the first in this, so for the two use cases that we looked at, here are the list of challenges that we have to address from an infrastructure perspective. First one is the uh, complex uh, punctuated session windowing. And uh, we're working on making this reusable. So if you have use cases similar to this, the users can use our library. They can um, programmatically configure it, and it'll do the right thing uh, for identifying the start and end sessions and applying the processing on it. The accessing of data from other services was the challenge for use case one. And for the second use case, we also have very large state. So you're talking about you know, millions of users, uh, tens of billions of events, and sessions that last two to 24 hours. And then we also have to uh, worry about accuracy, fault tolerance, and uh, data parity. Let's say you are moving from version one to version two. How do you know the version two is uh, good? It's not introduced any regressions. And especially in stateful systems where we are flushing state down, it becomes even important because how do you redact everything that you've produced downstream? Um, and once you have errors in your stateful in your state that you're sending downstream, it's very hard to correct that uh, compared to stateful stateless processing. So having a system to be uh, able to compare two versions and do a data parity analysis is very important, and it also helps you do canarying your uh, new versions of your code base. And uh, developer tooling is key. You should be able to run this locally on your laptop, be able to debug through it, and then easily deploy it um, onto, our, our, onto our cluster farm. And uh, what we found is these two use cases address a lot of the stream processing functionality that's expected out of the platform. And a majority of the use cases can be solved if your platform can support uh, the functionality that's needed for these two use cases. Uh, so that's why we chose those two use cases to begin with. So we built a multi-tenant stream processing as a service. How that looks is um, the user creates the job, whether it's point and click, DSL, or the custom code, and they submit through our self-service UI or they can submit a DSL to our self-service UI, and that ends up launching the jobs using our deployment orchestration tool called Spinnaker, which is open source, and it ends up running on our Titus container runtime environment. And to also deal with the challenges for stream processing, uh, we're working with Flink right now as a stream processing engine. We had SAMSA before, but that was a stopgap for us. Uh, it did the routing piece of it really well, but now we have two large set of use cases. One is the massively parallel routing use case, which actually supports our ingest pipelines. The second is to enable all these complex use cases where you need really complex stream processing to be able to get those data. 
to deal with out of order events. Uh, what do you do when you have late arriving data? Uh, how do you do complex windowing, um, sliding windows, even time based windows? So, for that functionality, we chose uh, Flink. So, this is how a deployment looks like on our container runtime. Uh, so, our internal container runtime is called Titus. It's kind of similar to how Borg works, if you're familiar with it. So Flink's architecture is uh, similar to Spark Streaming. They have a coordinator layer. So every job you launch has a uh, coordinator, which is to call the job manager here. Here we are showing the high availability mode, where we have two job managers running. So we have two coordinators. If one coordinator fails, the other one can take over. And then there are a bunch of uh, worker hosts called the task managers. So when you have a job graph that you're submitting to Flink, it figures out how to <clears throat> either chain your operators, how to distribute it across your uh, cluster that you've specified, and do the operations. So here the coordinator manages the distribution of workload across these task managers. And it also does something interesting. It takes checkpoints of your processing. So you could say, checkpoint what's happening in my job every 10 minutes, let's say. So every 10 minutes, the coordinator is going to send a signal. They're just called checkpoint barriers. And when those checkpoint barriers reach each of these nodes, each of them independently take a, take a checkpoint or a snapshot of their data set. So it's a distributed snapshot where each task manager is taking a shaft snapshot of the operation that's running inside it and saves it out to an external data source, that, source that's configured. Now, when all of them have successfully completed checkpointing for the checkpoint barrier, so let's say the checkpoint barrier ID is five. As soon as everybody has checkpointed five, the coordinator marks and writes to its own data store the metadata saying, checkpoint barrier five is successfully checkpointed. Um, now it's okay to go ahead and start the next checkpointing barrier. So the really nice functionality of this is, let's say you have a failure. When this cluster comes back up, it reads the metadata, the coordinator reads the metadata, and knows that there were X number of task managers that were running. It knows the location of each state where it left off. It sends that metadata to these task managers who pull in parallel their corresponding snapshots that they've taken, and they actually begin where they left off. So this is the exactly one's processing semantics. It's not exactly one's delivery, but it's exactly one's processing semantics. What that means is, let's say you're adding uh, counts, and you have two plus four plus five, so you have 11 clicks that a user has done. If you don't have this checkpointing mechanism, then <clears throat> either you may end up less than 11 or more than 11. So in this scenario, let's say you added two and four, and you're at six, and then you have five being processed here, but you have a failure. Now, when this job gets resurrected, the state that gets resurrected is five, uh, sorry, six. And then it'll start processing the click with the count five, and then it'll add 11. So now you have pretty fault-tolerant functionality to begin where you left off. There's another feature, it's called save pointing, which is user-initiated user checkpointing. So you could look at the complex state of your job and uh, take a save point, just like a database save point and you could start a completely brand new job in parallel which starts at that save point. So you could do something very interesting like Git where you can branch off at different points of your state and then either use it for A-B testing or data parity or validation of how your new job is doing. And uh, the save pointing mechanism actually is built in uh, to Flink and uh, we leverage that. So this is our container runtime and the complex stream processing job that we're talking about actually runs right here. So there's a lot of machinery that goes into making it multi-tenant. Uh, we had our own container runtime before. Uh, we had this general functionality available within Netflix. And now we have this uh, complex functionality available. It leverages uh, Mesos, uh, Arfenzo Scheduler, which is our open source project. Uh, Cassandra internally, and uh, we reuse Docker heavily for it. So every job that gets deployed onto this infrastructure is a Docker image, 
And uh, our stream processing infrastructure actually provides the functionality to build these jobs. So what does our infrastructure actually look like? At the lowest level is the uh, AWS EC2 runtime. Then we looked at the Titus runtime, which is our container runtime that's shown here. On top of this layer, we built something called SPAS core, which is based on the Flink uh, runtime engine. And to this, we add integrations into our ecosystem. Uh, how, do we talk to Keys, uh, how do we talk to Kafka? How do we talk to Elasticsearch? How do we route events to Hive? And we make some of the reusable components available so that when a user wants to process events, uh, like the custom windowing is available for them to reuse and leverage what we've built. They can reuse the syncs. So we have functionality to index data into Elasticsearch, and they can configure how they want their in, uh, events to be indexed. What's the ID field? How do they want to rotate their indexes? Is it daily, monthly, yearly? Or uh, don't rotate the indexes at all? So all that functionality comes out of the box. We also know how to discover these things and how to talk to them automatically. Um, so all that functionality gets leveraged as a reusable component for people who are writing jobs on this framework. Uh, the whole Keystone pipeline that we looked at that processes over uh, 1.3 trillion events is actually built on this functionality. So this is kind of a product that we offer. And if the product that we offer, if it's not enough to solve the complex use cases, then engineers can write their own complex application leveraging this whole stack. And uh, we also have uh, metrics and monitoring along the stack that we offer out of the box. So how many events are getting into your Kafka pipeline? How many events are your, is your stream processing job processing? Are you keeping up with the inflow of events? Um, are you doing regular checkpoints? What's your checkpoint size? Are there any anomalies in that? So all that uh, functionality that's needed to keep these jobs operational and running 24-7 uh, is offered out of the box. And we have a self-service management UI. I think that's a very critical piece of our component, which allows us to scale without adding a lot of people onto the team. Otherwise, it's really operationally uh, burdensome if you had to react to every single request that came in without having this management UI and, uh, UI and service. So in the past uh, couple of years, we've evolved the system two times. We had a legacy system that we replaced with Kafka and Samza. <clears throat> and now we are replacing it with um, our new Titus runtime environment and Flink. So, and while we did this, we kept our service up and running uh, without downtime or losing events. And our SLA was to not lose more than 0.1% of the data while we do these huge migrations. The first migration was a complete rewrite and a brand new system. And we still had to process a trillion events. And the new system, we have the Kafka framework that's constant, but we have replaced all our stream processing engine and how we do self-serve and all that stuff. So during this whole migration, we cannot have data that's different. So we have to, do, we have to compare every single event that's going out in a day. So we compare about 2.6 petabytes worth of data every single day to see if there are differences in count, if uh, the SHA of those messages are different, to see if there's any difference in data itself, and uh, what kind of duplicates are we generating? Are we du generating excess duplicates, or are we losing data? So the way we do that is uh, by building extensive tooling and also building self-healing, self-recovering infrastructure and having a lot of metrics and monitoring along different points to tell us what's happening. So for uh, the example of our ingest pipeline, in the second round, we replaced this whole big layer. And uh, this is hundreds of jobs, and it's thousands of instances, you know, upwards of four or 5,000 instances that are running all these jobs. And these are running inside a new container runtime environment. And we were the first large-scale service on that container runtime environment. So there were a lot of moving pieces uh, that we had to replace. And we did that in about uh, six months. And we built some really interesting tooling to make that happen. So the first thing that we built was when you're switching between different implementations of the router, we want to make sure that we leave off where we, we start where we left off reading from a Kafka stream. 
So we have this old router here, and let's say it was reading at offset 10 in Kafka. So it read message 10, and we decided that now is the time to migrate it. So we terminate this, and we launch this new router. Now this one needs to know that the last message that was successfully processed by the old router was 10. And the next thing it needs to do is start reading from 11. So what we did is when this migration happened for the first time, this router was checkpointing these message markers onto a different Kafka cluster. So this would write offset 10 into a different Kafka cluster. When we did this automatic deployment, it would take this offset number 10 and copy it over onto a different cluster where the new router was actually checkpointing. So then the new router starts resuming processing of events in the Kafka stream from where the old one left off. So the new router would start processing from offset 11. Now what if you realize you have a regression or you have an issue with your new router and you want to actually roll back? So you can roll back. We do the same thing in reverse. We copy the offsets back from the old, from the new router checkpointing system to the old router checkpointing system and then we can recover. The other thing we did is uh, doing smarter deployments. So there are some downstream customers who expect really low latency because they're processing these events in uh, real time. For other customers, the data is landing in Elasticsearch or Hive and the latencies, they're fine accepting the latencies. So for low latency jobs, what we do is we start the new job first. And once it's working correctly, we terminate the old one. Right. For the low duplicate scenario, we completely turn off the job that's running right now, and then we launch the new job. So that does introduce latencies, but it's guaranteed not to have duplicates because we know exactly where to start off once our job's terminated. So with an always on stateful stream processing system, uh, it's really imperative to have the following features or tool sets in your infrastructure. You need to have ways to do data parity validation so that you can evolve your system with confidence. Uh, you need to have a way to run a couple of jobs in parallel so that you can see how they're processing together. And then you need some way of doing smart deployments so that you can address requirements for low latency or um, low duplicates kind of scenarios. And then we do have scenarios where they need both low latency and low duplicates. And that's where uh, we do something interesting with Flink. What we do is we start up a new Flink job. We put it in a pause state. So it's not processing anything, but it's warmed up. It's up and running. Uh, all the code base is up. Then we stop the old one. So it stops, takes a checkpoint, and gracefully shuts down. Then we issue a request to the new one saying, begin where the old one left off at that checkpoint. And so the downtime is very, very small. And it starts up almost immediately. So to uh, wrap up, you know, typically 80% of the effort uh, in building these real-time stream processing pipelines is spent on creating the infrastructure. And a lot of the times this onus is on data engineers who don't have the expertise of distributed systems uh, to build them in a such a way that they're fault tolerant and uh, keep them always running. And that leaves them very little time to actually spend on data analysis. So we are reversing that equation uh, by building these uh, infrastructure component and functionality using Duplo blocks. Uh, we've come a long way since we started with this effort, uh, but we are just beginning uh, to scratch the surface. We have a lot, lot more long ways to go in building our DSL so that uh, it's very easy for data engineers to launch a job like do windowing uh, over the fast, past five minutes in a sliding window way and give me how many clicks the user made. Right. Something like that today, uh, if you're doing Spark streaming, you'll have to launch your own cluster, write the code, submit the job, and get it running. Versus uh, we want to make it so easy that you have a SQL-like dialect, uh, if you're familiar with Apache CalSite or something similar to that. So that just writing that, submitting, and clicking a button, they have a job deployed, it's running fully, they have all the infrastructure available for them to evolve it, to operate it, to run it, there's metrics and insights available to, uh, for them to look inside and see what's happening. So I think that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.
Thank you. So the question is, the wrapper library, is it internal to Netflix or is it open source? So we have an open source library. Um, however, the enhancements that we have made, we kind of contribute back uh, to the Kafka community. And uh, we talked to the Kafka communities to roll those enhancements in. So a couple of enhancements that we did there was, how do we do our uh, stickiness when you're producing? So what happens is when you're producing events to Kafka partitions, if a partition is down, then you cannot produce to it. So you have to go to the next partition. What happens to the messages that are in your buffer currently? Uh, like, do you drain them? How long do you wait? So that's one. The next one is, how do you effectively batch them uh, so that you have better efficiencies in batching events and you can, have much, you can support much more higher scale? So those kinds of enhancements, we work with the community to make them better. But then there are a whole bunch of other integrations with our integra internal systems, uh, like our uh, service discovery system, our metric system. And uh, those integrations are not really useful for the community because they're specific to our environment. Uh, and the way we switch our routing maps using um, dynamic properties. So that's, those kinds of integrations are hard to open source. Uh, so the things that we can contribute back to the community, we push it upstream into the main Kafka build itself. Right, so we have a bunch of clusters, and the way we look at, like, at them is we have something called dedicated clusters, and we have general purpose clusters. The user is unaware of this. So if their byte rate, provisioning byte rate, is below uh, a certain limit, and the way we go about it is every partition is about half a megabyte worth of uh, data flow for us. So up to 12 partitions, if anybody provisions a topic that can fit in 12 partitions, we put them on this cluster A. If it's much larger and more than like 100 megabytes byte rate, then uh, we, find the part, we find the cluster where there is space available, and then we kind of automatically create the topics there. If you realize that the uh, provisioning request is really large and doesn't fit any of our clusters, then um, we provision it slightly differently. That provisioning takes a little longer, so either we'll move the topics around to different um, clusters, and we use the same Kafka mechanism when we move top topics over. We'll move a topic to a new cluster. Um, we'll have our automation route the events for that topic to a new cluster, and then we can kind of move it back and forth that way. And then we'll create a new cluster if we need to and if we need to expand. So there are three stages. Uh, by default, they'll land up on a cluster where there's space, and it's commonly used. If it's larger than that, then they go into a cluster where we know there is space and it's dedicated for those larger scale topics. And if all that uh, doesn't work and we still need extra capacity, then we'll just create a brand new cluster. And that'll take a little, little time. Uh, we do have automated pipelines uh, through Spinnaker, our tool, uh, to launch the new cluster. So it's very easy for us to launch them and set them up. I'm going to be around for, uh, for some more time here, so if you have any questions or if you have ideas or if you want to collaborate on what you guys are doing, uh, I'd be happy to chat more. Thank you.